Good morning. Good to hear you singing. It was powerful to hear so many voices singing praise to our Father. It's a wonderful thing when the people come to the house of the Lord. If you'll turn with me in your scriptures to Colossians chapter 2, we'll be looking at verses 6 and 7 this morning. While you're doing that, I want you to think about this statement. Jesus doesn't just want to bless people. He wants people to follow him. Jesus doesn't just want to bless people. He wants people to follow him. If you remember last week, I mentioned that we should prayer persistently until God blesses us. And I think that we should. But underlying that heart of seeking God's blessing is the idea of following Jesus. If we seek blessing without following, any joy that we might have is just temporary. Paul's prayer that the Colossians would receive the riches of God are preceded by his prayer that they would live a life worthy of their calling. So in our passage this morning, Paul is asking the Colossians to respond to God's blessing, and he wants them to follow Christ. Now, this is where we've been. Started off with a greeting, talking about how God is a God of grace and a God of peace. Paul thanked the Lord for the testimony of the Colossians, for their love for one another and their love for the Father. He extolled the supremacy of Jesus over all of creation and as the head of the church. He prayed that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. He prayed that they would live a life worthy of that calling. He struggled for them in prayer that they will not be persuaded by plausible arguments. And today he exhorts them to walk in Christ. So our passage this morning reads, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus as Lord... So walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. When I first read this passage, the the part that popped out at me was that they were taught something. They were taught something. Remember, Paul didn't start this church. He had never been to this church. He had only heard about them through Epaphras. So the question I had in my mind was, who started the Colossian church? Who taught them the things that they were to remember? Well, the tradition is is that Epaphras had met Paul for the first time in Ephesus when Paul was there, when he planted that church, that he heard the gospel, was converted, and then sat underneath Paul's teaching for the time that he was in, in Ephesus, which was about two or three years. After which, he then became an evangelist for the area and started and planted the church in Colossae, which he then taught them the things that he had learned from the Apostle Paul. He leaves there, and he goes on, and he, and he joins the Apostle in his ministry, and, and Epaphras tells them all about the Colossians. So Paul is now writing them because they, he had heard through Epaphras that there were questions creeping in, arguments that were persuasive, and he wanted to encourage them to continue to walk in what they had been taught. And so this morning, he, he, he exhorts them to walk in Christ. The question then, as we think about walking, is what does it mean to walk in Christ? Or rather, what does it even mean to walk? I found a definition that I thought you might be interested in, in terms of the definition of walking. Walking is defined by an inverted pendulum gait in which the body vaults over the stiff limb with each step. I like this definition a little better. Walking is a steady movement in a specific direction. Much easier to think about. Walking is a steady movement in a specific direction. That's what it means to walk. Now, Paul does use the imagery of running a race, but in that passage, he's talking more about the prize that we're looking for. Because when you think about walking, walking takes the long view. Walking takes the long view of the trip. 
See, running has one goal in mind, to run faster than the other team and get there before they do. This picture is from Alaska. They have about every year a 200-mile marathon, which teams of 13 people will run. They dress lightly, they wear good shoes, and they go as fast as they can to get there before other people. The other side of traveling is walking. It takes a longer view. And there are these events that happen around the world, and they're called long walk events. And people train for them. And what they do is they, they try to establish first their base gait. They, they walk as far as they can and see how fast they can walk it and, and, and still have energy for the rest of the day, right? And so in the training, every week, they will add 10% to the length of their walk. So they're trying to learn to walk a great distance at, in a very persistent way without becoming tired. And because they have to carry everything with them during their training, they carry their backpack. The question I have is, is what is the most important piece of equipment that they wear? And it's their, their footwear. They have to have really good footwear. Because if they don't, no matter how, 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 how in shape they are or how light their backpack, if they do not have the proper footwear, then they will not make it very far. So I started thinking about footwear. <laughs> and the top lines of footwear aren't very good for walking long distances. I've never worn high heels. I don't, would not like to wear high heels. I don't see how anybody could wear high heels. But they do, and they look elegant when, they are, when people are dressed up. But ask them to walk a long distance, not very good. You get all the way to the end, and you've got flip-flops. Now, when we were up in Alaska, I went Parker. Um, he's, he's from our church, and he's a missionary up there. He took me fishing one morning. And we drove quite a distance. We got out and walked another mile to the river. He was in flip-flops. I mean, we were, we were told to bring good walking shoes. And here he is in flip-flops, tra traipsing through the mud. And it was cold and rainy, and his feet about froze off. Mine, however, I had proper sho shoes, and I was fine at the end of the trip. We didn't catch any fish. But we had a good walk. But you have to have good footwear when you're going for a long walk. So when we think about it in terms of the Christian walk in Christ, what is the footwear that we are supposed to have? Paul says this. He's talking, about, he's talking in Ephesians about the armor of God and what we're to put on. And he says this in Ephesians 6.15. Put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given... By the gospel of peace. So if we're talking about walking in Christ, the proper footwear to get us to where we're going is the gospel of peace in our life. And it's also about the readiness of that gospel. So not only are we to wear it because that's going to get us where we're going, we also have to be ready to share the gospel of peace to other people along the way. Now, we were on the ferry going up to Haines, and, and it was packed. And it was packed with people who were running this 200-mile marathon. And so we sat next to this guy who was a traveling dentist. He said dentistry is boring, and so he became a traveling one. He flies into all the remote areas of, um, of Alaska, and he takes all this equipment with him. And so when he travels there, he's looking at, he's telling us about their race and how, how hard it was and how difficult it was. He needed to have good footwear. And so people would ask him, so we were sitting there asking him, so where were you from? What are you doing? Because when you're on a trip and you meet people, you automatically ask them who you are and where you're going. And so as Christians, when we meet with people and they ask us, where are we going and how are we getting there? We should be ready to share the gospel of peace. Now, this passage that Paul, um, uh, he, he also, in Romans 10, 15, he talks about another passage about feet. He says, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, which is taken from Isaiah 57, which gives us a broader picture. He says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation and says to Zion, 
your God reigns. And so when we are about walking in Christ, we are to be ready in sharing the gospel and to declare to anybody who will listen, our God reigns. And so that's the beginning of walking in Christ. That's just the beginning. Now what Paul does in this passage is he gives us two pictures of what it means to walk in Christ. He says, just as you have received Christ as Lord, I want you to walk in him, rooted and built up in him. And so I started asking the question is, what does it mean to be rooted? Rooted. So we were watching, I don't know if anybody's watched videos of the hurricane. We were watching um, the hurricane videos, and there was this one, it was time lapse, and it showed the rising water. But it was just whipping these uh, palm trees back and forth, back and forth. And it was just amazing how these palm trees didn't break and how they stood through all of that wind and that rain. And it was because they were rooted by a taproot that went straight down. Now, you might think of this picture. This is the tree of life. Yes, it still exists. It exists in Bahrain. Out in the middle of the desert, there is this tree. It's been there for hundreds of years, and nobody knows how it survives. They think, some people think, that it has a taproot that goes down about 50 meter, m- meters into the ground and, and reaches some river underneath the, underneath the island. Some people believe that it has learned to absorb moisture from the surrounding sand. Some people believe that this is the area of the Garden of Eden, and this is the original tree of life, and therefore has a mystical way of of gathering moisture in order to survive. But it's been there for hundreds of years. Why? Because there's a root that goes down. There are two types of roots. There's a tap root that goes straight into the ground and holds a tree firm, and then there's fibrous roots that, that kind of go out, and they're usually of small plants. Now, when you think about in Christ and being rooted, we would then think of a taproot that goes down into the ground and holds us firm into the foundation, and that foundation is Christ. And so when Paul says, I want you to be rooted in him, we think of being established in such a way that would keep us from breaking and falling over. I start thinking about that, that there's another picture of roots that is very unique, and it comes from this tree or this type of trees, this is the tallest living organism in the world. Okay, this is the redwood forest in in California. They are the tallest trees in the world. Before discovering this one, the tallest tree was the Sherman tree, which was 275 feet tall. And the base of it was 100 feet in diameter. It was said to be 2,500 years old. Then in 2006, they found this tree. It's the hyperin tree. It stands 379.7 feet tall. And it is the, I don't know how they missed it, you know, until 2006. (laughs) My goodness, the thing just stands. If you want to kind of understand the size of it, you compare it to these structures. And it dwarfs them. So you ask the question is, what holds these trees up? Is it, it must be a taproot that just goes right down to the foundation. But it's not. The redwoods have a very unique root system. And it is intertwined like this. The root system of a redwood only goes to be about maybe six feet deep. But what keeps it from falling over is that the roots uh, make their way out. They bump into other roots. They intertwine with them and fuse with those roots. So the whole redwood forest is held up because of the unity of their root system. And it stands, and they don't fall over. They're thousands of years old. So when I think of us as we are rooted and and established in Christ, what does it mean? Well, I do think it means that we have a taproot that goes in and holds us strong into, into our Savior, Jesus Christ. But I also think that we're rooted together in unity in Christ. We're rooted together, and it's our unity that helps to make us as Christians stand strong against the storms of life. We can, we can do it on our own and be tapped in Christ and be like a palm tree, or we can grow and stand for thousands of years because we're rooted together in unity, still on the foundation of Christ, but we're rooted together. That's what it means when he says, be rooted. He also then takes a different turn on his picture, and he says, not only do I want you to be rooted, is I want you to be built up in him. Got me thinking, 
What does it mean to be built up? This structure here is the new, um, the new chapel uh, at Echo Ranch. I know all my pictures are from Alaska, because so that's where we were just at. Right, so this is the new chapel. Now, Juno is, is, has jurisdiction over the camp now. It's part of the city. As, as far away as it is, it's part of the city. So they have regulations that if you're in a floodplain, your building has to be on a cement structure that, is, that, is, uh, that, that has these big posts, cement posts that are planted into the ground at a certain depth. I don't know the depth. So this building has like four of those across and eight of them deep, and there are these big cement um, pillars, and they're planted in there so that when they built the building, they built it on a strong and sure foundation. Now, when we are built up in Christ, he is our foundation. He is the structure by which we are built, and if we are built on him, when the storms of life come, we will stand firm. I was telling you about the, the uh, time-lapse photography that we watched, and we were watching those, those um, palm trees go back and forth and the, and the flood rise up. And in the background was a building that fell apart and was washed away because it was not built on a sturdy foundation. See, we need to be built up first on a good foundation, and that is Christ himself. Now, inside this chapel are these massive beams, and they, they run the, the span of the, the building. The wood here is all from the camp, and, and, and some of it's from Juneau area. It's all milled at the camp. They have their own sawmill, so from rough timber to, to, to finished timber, it's all done there. 200 volunteers a year for the past two or three years have come to the camp to build this structure. All volunteers. They would, some of those volunteers were very skilled laborers, but they were all volunteers. So I started thinking of what does it take to build a structure like this? And the first thing it takes is quality materials. It takes quality materials to build a good structure. You can build a structure with bad materials, but it will fall down. I mean, I'm not a construction uh, person, but I know some, and I'm sure they would say the same thing. Good materials makes it for a good building. So what are some of the, 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 the quality uh, materials that we need in our life to be built in Christ? And the first one is purity. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And in this context, he's not talking necessarily about pure in the sense of, of immorality. He's talking about pure in the sense of innocence. Blessed are the innocent in heart. Jesus said, if you had the faith of a child, and that's the kind of purity that God is looking for in terms of building a person up in Christ, that we come to him in innocence and saying, Jesus, I need you. The second material that we would need is to have a humble heart. He leads the humble in, in what is right and teaches the humble his ways. And humility is simple. It's not seeing yourself as better than other people. And when you come to God, you're saying, God, I know that I don't know very much. The older I get, the more I don't know. It's as simple as that. The, more I, the older I get, the less I truly understand about a lot of things. And so I need to come to God and say, God, I need you. And it takes humility to do that. Humble means that we put other people beside our, over ourselves. We think of other people's needs before we think of our own. In order to be built up in Christ, we need to have that innocence that comes to God in faith and that and we have that humility that says, I need you. The third thing that we need is a teachable heart. Keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Because if you're innocent and if you're humble, but you're not teachable, well, it probably means that you're not humble and you're not innocent. Because you, if you are, you would be teachable. It's basically, it's, it's when someone comes to you and says, you know, you're not you're not living quite the way God wants you to. This is the word of God. And you go, you know, you're right, and I need to change that, and I become teachable. Which leads then into the fourth one, and that is be obedient. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. So we need to be obedient. Being teachable is great, but if we, we learn something new, but we don't apply it in obedience, then we're not really teachable or humble, or pure. And so these are the quality things that we need in our lives that, that only really Christ can build in us. 
But we need them if we're going to be built in him. The third thing that we need when we're building a structure is we need a plumb line. A plumb line or a level. Now, a plumb line, if you don't know what that is, it's a really a, it's a string with a, that at the end of it is tied a non-magnetic piece of metal. And when you hold it up and it stops swaying or swinging, it will make a true vertical measurement. And so um, construction workers would use a plumb line to make sure their doors were straight or their building was straight, and that's how they would make sure it was straight, right? Now we use levels, laser levels, those kinds of things to make sure it's straight. In other words, we need a standard by which we measure our lives. If we're going to be built in Christ, we need a standard, and that standard is the righteousness of God. Isaiah says this, from here. He says, I will make justice the measuring line and the righteousness the plumb line. So it is the righteousness and justice of God who is exhibited in Christ himself. Jesus is our measure. We measure everything of our life against the true measure of Christ. It is his righteousness. It is his justice, his mercy, his grace that gives us direction. And if we're going to build ourselves up in Christ, then we have to measure everything against him. Because if we don't, then we will not be on a firm foundation and our structure will not survive. He goes on from here and he says, look, he goes, just, therefore, just as you have received Christ as Lord and I want you to walk in him, being rooted and built up in him, and then I want you to be established in your faith. I want you to be established in your faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So I asked the question, what does it mean to be established? And the word just means to be secure and confident in what you believe. You see, doubt is a weed that grows in a place you don't want it to and is really difficult to eradicate. Doubt is a weed that grows where you don't want it and is really difficult to eradicate. Now Jude teaches us that we are to be patient with those who doubt. But he's talking about non-believers and new believers. If you've been a Christian for a long time and you are still wrestling with doubt, then you are not established in the faith. You need to be teachable. You need to be humble. You need to be pure. If you're not established in the faith, you start to have doubt. So you might ask the question, was, how do I know then when I am established in my faith? Well, you abound in thanksgiving. When you are established in your faith, you abound in thanksgiving in all circumstances. Whether they are good circumstances or if they are hard circumstances, we give thanks to the Father. Because when we, give, when we are grateful in all circumstances, then we have truly come to understand all that Christ has done for us on the cross. If we doubt any of that, and doubts do come, it means that we have not truly grasped the depth of what Jesus has done. And it makes it very difficult to be grateful when we're doubting. But thanksgiving and gratefulness is the evidence of an established life. Now this morning, we have two young men who are going to be baptized. They are making a decision today, or they have made the decision and want to make it public, that they want to walk in a consistent direction. And that direction is towards Christ. They are making a decision that they want to walk in Him, being rooted and built up, and established in their faith. They're making that decision today. And they want to proclaim it to you. So these two guys are going to come up and they're going to give you their testimony. They're going to tell you about where they, how they have come to know Christ and what he is doing in their life today. And then we're going to baptize them as a symbol. It's a beautiful picture when you think about it. Baptism is when you go under the water. It's a picture of us dying in Christ. And washing away our sin. And when you come out of it, it is a resurrection to new life. Because we have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. So, I'm going to ask Isaiah to come up. And which microphone is he using? This one over here. 
He's going to share his testimony. We're going to then baptize him. Hello, can you hear me all right? Hello, my name is Isaiah Mikesell. Um, a lot of you know me already, some of you a little too well. Um, and I'm 18 years old. I'm a senior at Bluffton High School, and uh, normally I sit right up there. Um, <laughs> I'm looking to get baptized today, and I'm very excited. Uh, so I'll just jump right in. I, like many of you, uh, grew up in a Christian household with, many, with amazing parents who took me to church, Awana, VBS, and Pioneer Club to help me learn about Jesus. I memorized verses and learned that I needed to pray to God to be saved. I was taught by my leaders that I needed to realize what God had done for me and admit my sins. I needed to ask for forgiveness and ask God to come into my heart so that I could be saved and live in heaven with him when I die. So when I was about five, I prayed really hard for God to come into my heart and that I loved him. I did that for a week straight until someone told me that I only needed to do, needed to do it once and then he would stay there. I kept living my best little boy life and was on fire for Jesus. I did that for years, and once I got into middle school, my faith started to go up and down. In middle school, I struggled with being immensely insecure about my weight. I was always down on myself and never looked to God for help. I started cursing to be cool. That never did anything. I did, however, go through middle school with some spiritual highs like Spring Hill and Penfield Hills Summer Camp. <clears throat> I started high school and was changed so much by my new environment. A lot of people still didn't talk to me or like me because of my weight or inability to fit in. But during sophomore year of high school, I decided to join the wrestling team to lose weight and do something cool. I lost 20 pounds the first year and 10 the next, and was so confident in myself and my ability to do anything. However, junior year of high school started a whole new level of my life. I started the year with a very unhealthy relationship that was far away from God's control. My distance from God made my mind struggle, and my everyday decisions were poor in faith. I still came to church, but I had bad attendance at youth group, so I didn't have much study time for God. I struggled with pornography and impure thoughts. I never prayed for help or even to admit my sins. Wrestling season came up and we had a really bad leadership. However, I did improve my performance and body health. My mental health was diving. I struggled every day to get up and have energy and still keep up with an unhealthy relationship. I was dead physically and mentally. The last four weeks of my school year were a blur. I lost my 4.0, but I couldn't have cared less. I'd hit rock bottom and was stuck there. God was, I know in my mind that God was slowly working to turn me around without me knowing it. I started to see a counselor every week after my mom let me know that I could always ask for one if I ever wanted or needed help. I told her that. I told her all my problems to the counselor, and she was on it, man. She, she gave me so much spiritual advice, inspiration, and guidance. She helped me through ending my relationship healthily and finding God's path to follow. I went through a lot of struggles, as I said, poor mental health, an unhealthy relationship, pornography, cursing, impure thoughts, and insecurity. All these bad things in my life led me to think about all the bad things in my life all the time. But God reached out to me and said in Philippians 4.8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, <clears throat> whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I learned that instead of flooding my mind with sin, I should always turn away from those thoughts and actions and focus on the good things I have in my life, the people, the joy, and the love. My uncle once told me, I wish people would not focus on what they don't have, but instead focus on what they do have. That stuck with me along with this verse. In March, I got a new job on a farm, and I have loved my job so much. My boss made my day ten times better. And getting to see big tractors and trucks all the time was a dream come true let alone driving them. This past summer, I turned my life around and became so happy every day to get up and work with a friend. It was a slow process, but I stopped looking at pornography. I found an amazing friend group that challenges me to be a better person. I found a better connection with my youth leaders and meeting with them to talk about how I can improve my love and obedience to God. I understand now my connection with God. I want to be baptized today because I do believe that God has saved me from my sin and he made a path for me to follow. I have my total trust in the Lord, and I want to follow his directions. He has called, 
on us to be baptized in his name and to call out to him in repentance. God, has a love, God is a loving, just, and holy God. He is righteous in every way, and while we are the opposite. God's justice makes him un, unable to forgive us without something taking the penalty for our sin. Graciously, Jesus took our blame, and we no longer have the wage of death from our sins. God is so holy in his creations and judgment. He gives us comfort in his power to always know what's right. I think about how much sin I have in my life and how far away it puts me from God, but his love sets me free. I feel so full of trust in my everyday life and thoughts because I know God has a plan, and when I struggle, I just have to look to him and pray to him and follow his path. Following God's path is like driving. You see a stop sign, you stop. You see a yield sign, you yield. 55 miles per hour, whatever. Um, (laughs) But you see my point? (laughs) God has those signals, too. You just have to look for them. So thank you so much for listening and joining me on my journey today. Um, That's starting on this very special day. A lot of you inspire me to be the person I want to be. Thank you. Uh, if you don't know me, um, congratulations. <laughs> but you soon will, so that didn't last too long. Um, I have my family sitting in the back, uh, and then my family from Connecticut uh, watching. Um, also, my church family They're here to support me through this. Um, so, I'm 22. Um, I go to UNOH for business administration. Um, I pretty much am just living life right now. That's a, really about it. I don't do much otherwise. I work with uh, Gregus Smith at Schoolhouse, a bunch of wonderful guys there um, who love the Lord, and we've had some pretty good um, discussions about the Lord on a long van ride and whatever. Um, so I grew up in a Christian home. Um, how I would describe it is my mother wanted to know more about God, but my father kind of was more into the conspiracy theory, uh, aspect of Christianity, which was harmful for him, um, and not great for his children as well. Uh, later in life, um, we were attending a church and it was, it wasn't great. It was a borderline omega church, um. I didn't feel like anyone really knew me there. I didn't feel like um, people really cared that much. I just attended. I attended church. I went to the Bible studies. My dad was a leader there. Um, I went through the system, um, just like school. I mean, who really gave a crap type of thing? Um, So that was pretty much my start to the um, religious world. I did... Luckily, um, I asked if God into my heart when I was younger, um, upstairs in my bed with my mother. Um, and then I went to all of the camps. I went all to the things that everyone was like, this kid is, he's got it down. Um, but I really didn't have anything down. Um, I was once baptized in the same church. 
uh, younger or younger about like 11 or so. Um, and I think I did have an understanding of what baptism really was, but I also was doing a class with a bunch of adults as an 11 year old. So I didn't really feel like integrated in the whole baptism experience. Um, and I didn't really fully understand really what was going on. I knew my friends were doing it at summer camp. I knew this is what adults do. And I wanted to be more like an adult, so bam, I did it. Um, and then after that, um, my parents got divorced, which now, looking back now, it's a great thing. I, I don't think it would have been good for me to have um, parents who didn't love each other, uh, each other in, in the same house and being around my father 24-7. Um, but yeah, it definitely gave me a bunch of issues later on that I would have not understood at the level of adult that I had. Um, so the, the types of things I'm talking about, he never showed up on time to get me to soccer practices. He didn't like that I was in soccer. He wanted me to play football. Um, and he constantly told me that. Um, I, he uh, constantly, I mean, he didn't model what a father should really be. And I see that now. And I'm able to get past that. I want to build a relationship with him now that I know that I'm more spiritually fortified um, and can throw away the negative stuff that he's said to me in the past or present. I can filter that through uh, no matter what. Um, and I was homeschooled uh, pretty much my entire life until freshman year of high school. So I was thrown. I wasn't thrown. I shouldn't say that. Um, I asked to go into high school because I was big into soccer, and I had played with a bunch of people from the public school um, area. So I went to high school, to Bluffton High School, and um, I played soccer. I, I was really bad. I was really bad at soccer, I was really overweight. And, you know, like, it, then I was thrown into this different crowd that I wasn't aware of, a different culture. And how do I deal with that? I have divorced parents, and I'm young. I was a homeschooler, thrown into a different culture. Uh, yeah, and then you have upperclassmen in soccer who weren't the nicest, but whatsoever. I, I don't know. But um, so then I got into the issue of pornography because of all these things that were going on. Didn't have any real way of handling it. I had anger issues. Um, probably a lot of other things I really can't name right now. I don't fully remember, mainly because I don't want to. Um, so I got through all that. Sophomore year, looking a little bit better. Um, getting better at soccer. I'm meeting up with a bunch of friends who went to the Yoder's Bible study. Um, and so I'm getting a good foundation of friends, and it's going well. I'm starting to kind of hit my stride. Uh, my mother uh, saw the issues going on, so she got me to counseling. Uh, so we went to counseling for anger and pornography, um, which helped a lot. Um, it was fantastic for me. Um, so I had a good friend group going to counseling, and I'm getting better at soccer. Um, so then I go to my junior year, made varsity, not to pat myself on the back or anything, um, and I have these great friends, I'm living my best life, I'm doing well in school, um, I'm not starting driving yet because I didn't want to take any of the classes um, initially, um, and then senior year, same thing, got my license, starting varsity, senior um, already have a college picked out. Everything was going great for me. I got my first job. It was hard work, but I did it. Um, and that ended. That was fine. I started my uh, career at UNO, or UNOH. Um, yeah, it was, I had my car. I had, I pretty much had everything. I had money. I had a, another new job, McDonald's, which quickly ended right after that. Um, 
And then, yeah, then the issues started to come back. I was more angry. Uh, I still had issues with pornography that came back. Um, And then I started to shut myself more in rooms and play a lot of video games because I could control that. And then that's when the control issues started to come about. Um, Time management was also a big thing. I was really into planning things down to the T. Since my father never showed up on time, I was going to make sure I was going to show up on time. Um, So I was getting to that point where I was going in a very dark path. Uh, I went to the Sprague's. I spent a lot of time with the Sprague's. And... uh, they, they helped me to understand that I need to live for the Lord in everything I do. Um, and they gave me a safe place to do that and talk and hang out and get away from my situation. Um, so that was great. I was still having issues, though. Um, COVID came around, and then it wasn't really that crappy for me, I guess. I enjoyed being by myself. I played a lot of video games. I got to high levels in Overwatch, which I'm kind of proud of and kind of not. Um, And so, you know, I was living the best I could. I didn't have to go outside. I got to do my homework inside. I, yeah, it was it was fantastic. And then after, that's when I was like, oh no, I have to go back into society. Oh shoot, I can't just sit in my little bubble anymore. And so. I got out into the bubble and pretty much burst. Like I, everything kind of went wrong. I I did stuff with friends, but I was just tempted by every little thing that was on the earth. Um, but then, I mean, this is a whole year in the making. This is a whole year of me just not caring whatsoever. Um, my my whole idea of guilt was out the window. I have zero guilt for squat, and I just do whatever I want. That was pretty much, yeah. The they're, they're technically not a Christian band, but they say they're Christian, which I don't understand that fully. 101 Pilots, uh, they have a song called Migraine, and their lyric says, uh, waging a war uh, behind my face and above my throat. So having a war in your head. And I described my temptation to my friends. And um, it was a lot of, yeah, you know, like, my head saying, yeah, don't do that. And then someone else is like, you should do that. And I'm like, no, I shouldn't do that. And it's just back and forth for, like, hours. And it really sucks. But um, I'm getting a lot better at doing that. Um, I, my mother was very persistent with me joining a Bible study group. That was great for me. And so I joined a... Bible study group Tuesday mornings with um, Jim King, and that has been a lot of help. Um, I sought counsel from Pastor Paul over, and we studied First Peter. He showed me how to uh, study the Bible and um, apply that to everyday life, which now I have my own thing going on, um, listen to the Bible every day, um, and then next time after I read or listen to the whole Bible, I'm going to go and um, compare three different translations of the Bible, so that's going to be fun. Um, I also had Pastor Pastor Paul Paul Ginther, um, he was challenging me throughout my life on challenging uh, speaking opportunities, uh, which I did not appreciate at the time, but he did do it anyways. Um, And then Mark Yoder helped me through a lot, Um, the Sprague's, uh, my friends, they they were there who was pushing me to be the best Dak I could be. Um, and then now, I'm, I'm living the Jesus high every day. It's, I'm on fire. I've learned a lot from my Tuesday morning group of guys. They have modeled what I want to be when I'm, I mean, they're, they're the age of my father. And I'm the youngster, the 20, 21, 22 year old rug rat of the group who's like knows technology and stuff um but that's who i want to be uh when i get when i get there they love the lord i love it um and then they gave me the courage to um 
with, with Caleb, Caleb Mikesell, right in the back, there he is, um, yeah, to get a word out there for a men's group. So we have a men's group that meets Monday nights at my house right now, and we do the study that the men's group does. Um, so I have this accountability, which I've really um, fallen short on, as Pastor Paul can uh, protest to that. He says, oh, how come you, you do this and then you text me? How come you don't text me before you do it and then we can talk about it? I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but, no, it, I've fallen very short of accountability with men, which I'm trying to really um, improve on. And this men's group is helping me immensely. And I can, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel um, for what I should be living like. And it's, it's fantastic. You, in the song above, it, or the, the song that we sang before, Let There Be Dancing in the Darkness, yeah, I'm learning a lot about that. I, I was driving home from Cedarville last night, and I was like, oh, thank you, Lord, for giving me this day and coming down here and spending time with my friends and, and providing me safe travels there and honoring you throughout the day. And I was like, I would have not been able to do that before. I would have been like, oh, this is okay. Some people push my buttons too much, but it was a crappy weekend. But no, it's, it was a fantastic Saturday. So that's pretty much where I'm at. I'm thanking the Lord for every opportunity I have and living for him. Yep. So I want to get baptized right now because I want to show where I'm at and show that I'm actually living the way that I believe God wants me to live and how he's shown in the Bible. And I want to say to the people who've made impacts in my life, this is who I am, and this is who I'm going to live to be. Awesome. Dakota, do you uh, understand that you are a sinner, a sinner who uh, needs to be saved from their sins? Do you accept, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord and, and want to live for him? So on, on, the, on your profession of faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, up, up in the front row here are their friends. I want you guys to come on up here. We're going to pray for them, and you guys have been a support for them, and so I want you to be a part of this as well. So uh, come out around them, and uh, we're going to, to pray for them. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for these two young men who have decided to walk um, in your son. And it's been a, a journey for them so far, and it's going to be a journey for them for the rest of their lives. But, Father, in you, there is hope. In you, there is strength. In you, there is salvation because our God reigns. And so, Father, we, we do ask a blessing on them as we help them to uh, be accountable to their lives in Christ. Father, we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> 